Good morning. Let's stand and worship together. I will welcome you today to Grace Bible Church. Uh, I wanted to tell you a couple of things. If you have been out in the foyer this morning, you've probably seen the Operation Christmas Child table. 
and you probably notice all the many dolls on there. These dolls were very craftily uh, designed by Helen Marin. Helen does these all year long for you. She's donated them to you. So anybody who is building, packing a girl's box, girl shoe box, you are welcome to take as many girl shoe box, as many dolls as you have girl shoe box that you want to put together. Helen's having surgery this week and she wanted you to have them now because she's not sure when she'll be able to uh, be back here. So please take some today because they'd be a great wow item for any age girl. Last week, Marvin and I went to a project leaders workshop. One of the things that we learned that I wanted to share with you is this is going to be the last year for soap. They've had a lot of problems with soap and in so many of the countries are not allowing our boxes in. Soap, since it is put on the skin of a child, is considered medicine, and so they are taking them out and throwing the boxes away. So you can do it this year, but then starting next year, it's going the way of toothpaste and candy. You cannot pack them anymore. The website says, if we knew that if we could remove one item from our, from our shoe boxes that would make sharing the gospel easier for the ministry, wouldn't we remove it? It's kind of sad because so many recipients talk about opening their box and getting that whiff of smell from a bar of Dove or Irish Spring or Dial and just saying how everything in there just smelled so sweet and clean. But um, it's going to be removed next year. You can still pack it this year. That's all. Come see us out in the foyer. Thank you, and welcome everybody. We're glad that you are here today. Just a few announcements. Hopefully you uh, received a bulletin when you came in. Um, there's going to be a men's breakfast, as always, on the first Saturday of the month. And um, a couple other announcements. In front of your uh, seat, in the seat back, you'll find a couple of inserts. One is our usual visitor information card. If you have never filled one of these out, we would love to know how to contact you, have your contact information. And on the back is a place for prayer request. And then also you'll see another card. And this is a giving feedback card. Um, so a few weeks ago, uh, the congregation got together and we voted that we wanted to move forward to pursue a, a building expansion. And we're excited to go forward with that. But this feedback is really helpful to the leadership so that we could know um, in good faith, you know, what, if any amount, do you feel like you could be able to contribute by the end of this year, 2024, toward the giving uh, building fund. And so if you would, please uh, fill one of these out as you're led and return it by October 6, and you'll put it in the offering basket in the back. Um, that gives you two weeks to kind of pray about this, think it over. Um, it's not... Uh, a blood oath. We're not going to take a lien on your house. We just really want to have some kind of basis uh, to be informed as to what we could hope to expect. All right, so if you will stand and say hi to the folks around you, we'll continue worshiping the Lord. worship together. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain. 
fixed upon it, Mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. From the dark side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting. And life has no end, for I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls the sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood. 
for Kids Church. Together and pray. Father, thank you this morning for the songs we have sung and for the great truths that are contained in them. Thank you for this uh, 
time and this place that we can come and gather in the name of our Lord and Savior and um, just set aside a time away from everything else for the sole purpose of worship. I pray now that as we continue to worship that we'll do so by giving full attention to your word. I pray that you will um, bless in what you have to tell us today. I pray that we'll be responsive to it and that it will move us toward this outrageous faith that we've been studying in Hebrews 11. But I pray that all that we do here now in these next half hour or so will be, again, you speaking to us through the person of your spirit, and we'll give you the praise and the glory for it because we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You know, one of the interesting things about the Bible is that a lot of the things that are found in the Bible, people, stories, events, and stuff that are recorded there, are also found out in secular arenas as well. Now, not with the accuracy that's found in Scripture, but somehow many of the things that are found in the Bible have uh, been somehow moved into other civilizations and cultures to where they um, have included them in their uh, traditions and things that have been maintained by them down through the centuries. Uh, Jesus, of course, is one of the primary examples of that. If you uh, read in the Quran, the Islam holy book, you know, Jesus is mentioned in there, but there he's not the sinless son of God who came to earth to die for our sins. He's presented in a whole nother light as a prophet of God, a great man, but uh, certainly not the son of God who died for our sins. Um, of all the stories in the Bible, though, there's one that really is kind of surprising in that it has been found worldwide in hundreds of places a story that we're going to be looking at today, but it's been found in a lot of different traditions with a lot of the details kind of messed up as those traditions have developed. And it's the story of, uh, of Noah and the ark. Uh, amazingly, that story has spread far and wide across the globe. About 150 years ago, uh, a British archaeologist working with a team from Britain by the name of George Smith was working with a team that was excavating the city of Nineveh, that you may recognize from the Old Testament scriptures pr primarily. And uh, thousands and thousands of clay tablets were found in Nineveh, more than 20,000. A lot of them are just broken in bits and pieces, so when they tried to translate from them, they would uh, only get bits and pieces of the stories or the records of what was being said. Um, but Smith was given one of these fragments, and this is what he read in the portion that he translated. The mountain of Nisir stopped the ship. I sent forth a dove, and it left. The dove went and turned in a resting place it did not find, and it returned. And then some other little fragments that were found go on to develop the story. But George Smith recognized right away that he was reading a pagan account of the great worldwide flood in the days of Noah. Uh, that's just the beginning, though, because uh, I read through a number of accounts this week of uh, similar things that were recorded in other places around the world. Like in uh, Mexico, for example, there is a tradition among some people groups about a man who saved himself and his family and some animals on a great raft. And as the waters began to subside, he sent out, well, not a raven like the Bible talks about, but a vulture <laughs> to fly back and forth. And the vulture didn't accomplish anything. And so uh, instead of sending out a dove, he sent out a hummingbird. And the hummingbird returned with a beak, uh, with a leaf in its beak. Um, among the Hindus of India, there's the story that has been found of a man who built a great ship which saved him and seven others from a great flood. Uh, and in that story, the way that one developed, a great fish pulled the boat up and deposited it, not on the mountains of Ararat, but on the Himalayas. Um, among many uh, American Indian tribes, uh, stories have survived about a great flood that destroyed everything that was evil and wicked. Um, in one tradition that I found very interesting, uh, it wasn't any kind of a bird at all that was sent out to find out whether the flood had gone away or not, but a coyote. <laughs> a coyote. <laughs> you think coyotes are worthless? Well, this one had a coyote as a hero. One that I found interesting, though, is not one that I read somewhere, but... In a previous church that we served, there was a family, and the dad in the family was uh, from China, and uh, he's an engineer, and uh, 
he knew a great deal about the Chinese alphabet and the pictures that were put forth in the Chinese alphabet and in the words that they use. And um, one of the things that he had told us about was about um, uh, the word for um, the word for that, that came across for this flood. Um, the word for ship or a large boat in Chinese is made up of three characters, one of a man, a second one of uh, just a regular word for boat, and then the third one of eight people, eight people, the number that were saved in the ark. And so there seemed to be there also a connection back to the biblical account. Hundreds of these have survived and are in existence, and um, I could tell you places where you can find a list if you're interested in going there. Um, but they are all relating back to the biblical account of Noah and the ark. Well, today we're going to be in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 just to identify and then come back to a little bit later Noah as, for what he's remembered here, being a man of outrageous faith. Remember, we've been talking about this outrageous faith that the writer of Hebrews is wanting to see developed in his readers, and we are his readers now. And he's been giving us a list that God's Holy Spirit has guided him to make of uh, people who had outrageous faith. Um, and Noah's the next one. Um, Noah's kind of interesting, though, and you may already know this, but as far as being attacked severely in our day and time and for a good number of years because of this whole story of a worldwide flood, you know, scientists of our day and time want to say, oh, this is just a ridiculous story. It couldn't possibly have been true. Uh, maybe it's a parable or something that somebody made up, but it certainly isn't something that uh, could possibly have ever occurred. Uh, I mean, one of the things they'll always question is, is there ev any evidence for such a flood? Well, I'm not going to go into any of that today because it will take weeks and weeks if we get off on that track, but of course there's evidence. There's evidence in the most unlikely places. Um, just one quick one that I just comes to mind here was in China. There's a great desert in China that has every evidence that at one time that was all underwater because of the fossils and things that have been found there, the sea creatures. Now it's just a total desert. You know, our earth has changed in its form and its shape and so forth. And, uh, you know, those kinds of th things are found in a, in a variety of places. But uh, is there any evidence for a flood? Absolutely. There's lots of evidence for a flood in the most unlikely places. Um, then there's always the question that's raised, well, where could all that amount of water come that would cover all of the earth, including the mountaintops, and be high above the mountaintops? Where did that all come from? Well, that's scientists' failure to take into account all the possibilities rather than just simply to assert that it couldn't have happened, right? Uh, of course, one of the big ones is uh, how could Noah possibly get all those animals on the ark? Uh, you know, and they come on apparently just very peacefully, you know, two at a time, you know, male and female. Uh, those of you who are young parents know that, uh, man, that's quite a feat if you've got children and you're trying to get them all in the car at the same time or trying to just get them ready to come to church on Sunday morning, right? <laughs> we could tell some stories, couldn't we, Ginger? Okay. Well, my intention today, of course, is not to attack and go after the, the, those objections. That would be a relatively easy thing to do. If you do want to do some additional reading and have it reasonably, easily accessible to you, you can find it online. There's some great places you can go. Uh, the Institute for Creation Research is a great, great place to go. Look at their website. Or Answers in Genesis is another place that gives a lot of good insight into uh, the facts uh, of, of the flood. Um, and then Probe Ministries, Probe Ministries with Kirby Anderson up in, uh, in, uh, here in Dallas uh, is another great place you can go and find a lot of articles that will deal with a lot of the interesting things that you may want to know if you want to increase your uh, knowledge of the, of the flood and, and the defense of the biblical account. But we want to stick with what our text, text of Scripture is telling us about today. Hebrews chapter 11 is talking to us about the subject of faith. Faith. And what we're calling outrageous faith. There's a list of people to be found here. 16 by name and others synonymously that were people of faith. 
who because of their faith achieved things that God wanted to have done or who survived terrible suffering and persecution because of their trust in him. He saw them through those difficult times or who he sets before us just as examples of what he is striving us to be. And um, those, are, uh, those are the reasons that this chapter is there to cause these people to whom he has been writing to want to have that kind of outrageous faith. Now, by the way, I just wanted to mention one other thing because it's something that should always be mentioned and it should always be in our minds and we think about those Old Testament stories that the, you know, the critics of the Bible today say can't possibly be true, couldn't possibly have happened and so forth. Um, greatest reason of all, in spite of the scientific research that we could provide that would defend the biblical viewpoint, we also should, uh, should realize that um, Jesus believed it to be true. Jesus believed it to be true. And that should be at the top of our list as to why I believe something to be true. Jesus never lied. Jesus never exaggerated in terms of uh, taking something and make it say something that it didn't say. If Jesus believed it to be true, Shouldn't that be enough for you and for me? In fact, Jesus used this story uh, of the great flood as something that he said would be similar to what would be happening in the end times. He said the thing of, the thing of Noah's flood um, and, and that happening was characteristic of the world at that time before that judgment came, and it's going to be characteristic of the end times, he says, in which you and I live before he comes again. Let me just read the passage to you from Matthew 24 in verses 36 and following. Jesus said, as far as his second coming is concerned, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. But listen to this. The coming of the Son of Dan will be just as it was in the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. I mention that because uh, recently we've had reason to think about in our messages and also in some other Bible studies and stuff that are going on, the terrible things going on in our world. Because the Bible talks about how bad things are going to be leading up to that time. But the other side of that is, is while there's all these terrible things that you and I see in the news every day and we read about through the media and we hear about all the time and we wonder how bad can things get, the other side of that, Jesus says, is that life will just be rocking along just as usual. People eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, going to their jobs every day, going to school, you know, playing sports, whatever it is that occupies our time, that will be very much in evidence, too, that people will basically be going about their lives, and the point here is totally dull to the truths found in Scripture about getting ready, making sure we're ready, that when Jesus comes to rapture the church, we will know that we have trusted and are trusting in Him alone. And so, just an example of how Jesus used it and and what it has even still to do today, Jesus believed in that story. Well, we're going to take a look then at um, Noah and his story. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 in one single verse tells us this about him. It says, by faith, Noah, verse 7, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. We're going to come back to several things that this is going to tell us about outrageous faith and what it's like. Every one of these people we look at gives us some characteristics of what outrageous faith is like if we're moving in the right direction and if we're developing that or seeing it developed in us. But let's first of all go back and reacquaint ourselves with Noah back to the book of Genesis, if you will, and uh, look at a little bit of background about the man and the times in which he lived, and then we will eventually come forward back to that verse in, in Hebrews. Um, who was this guy Noah anyway? Uh, 
You know, what do we know about him? Well, like so many others in the Bible, we don't know much of anything about him. <laughs> we don't know, um, we don't know uh, what his occupation had been. Um, we don't know, um, you know, how big his, uh, you, know, uh, you know, his business was. We don't know all the different things that we maybe would like to know about him. The one thing we do know about him, though, is that he was a man in line with a task that God wanted to see done. And uh, so there are a lot of great things um, that are to be learned there about his faith when he was responsive to what God gave him to do and set out to do it, even though at the time it probably sounded like the most impossible, ridiculous thing that anybody had been ever asked to do, build a big boat when they'd never even seen rain yet, never seen a flood yet, never seen anything like this happen. Let me just mention a few facts that we do know about Noah. If we were to read through Genesis chapters uh, uh, five through nine, particularly, you get the whole story. Uh, we would learn that he came from a, a godly family, that he was a godly man. Um, in fact, he was in the godly line of the son by the name of Seth, who was given to Adam and Eve. If you remember, Cain killed Abel, and, and um, so sometime later, God gave a second son, Seth. And uh, in Genesis chapter four, we read about how the two sons, Cain and Seth, became the heads of two different lines of civilization. Cain's line was the ungodly line, the wicked line, the line that had the heart of Cain. It was violent and wicked and that cared nothing for the things of God. And the other line was this line that God gave through Seth. And there's a whole genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 of the descendants of Seth. This was the godly line. These were the people who were concerned about the things of God. These are the ones who were advancing the principles of God, uh, who wanted to do the things of God. And Noah was in that godly line. He came from that godly line. Uh, we know that he was married, and he had... Uh, three sons and uh, three daughters-in-law, and uh, this would be the eight, <laughs> him and his family, that would be the survivors of the great flood when this is all over. That's it. Out of all the population, whatever that population was at that time, these would be the survivors. Something else I really like about him in Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 is that whatever he else he did for a living, he preached on the side. <laughs> He was a, uh, we would call him today, we'd call him a tent maker, right? He had a job, he worked at things. He had a big job, he had to build a big boat, right? That's what became his job. But he was preaching on the side. He was a preacher of righteousness, Peter said about him, a preacher of righteousness. You know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? When uh, we get into the Word of God, when we uh, get a hold of God's Word for our lives, it's an incredible thing that happens to us, though, when God's Word gets a hold of us, where great changes take place in us. There's a boldness that we didn't have before. There's a direction for life that they didn't realize before. Our interests change. We start living for different reasons and in different ways when God's Word gets a hold of us. And God's command to Noah got a hold of him, and he began to do the thing that God gave him to do. One other thing to note about him, I've been pointing this out week by week, is oftentimes the names of people in the Bible have uh, meanings that were significant for whatever God had set them aside to do. And the same thing is true here of this man, um, this man Noah, because his name means rest. It means relief. It means a deliverer out of some kind of terrible circumstance, one who would bring an end to that type of thing. Now, it wouldn't be the man Noah who would do that, but his father and his mother, I suppose, named him Noah. His father's name was Lamech and named him Noah because of the direction the world was going. Things seemed totally out of control. It looked like the world was going to self-destruct so we'll see in a moment, the scripture says that men's minds were on evil continually. And those who were of a godly nature, who had hearts that were turned somewhat at least toward God, wanted to see it end. Don't you sometimes wish you could just see the trouble in the world end? 
oh my gosh, I just wish I could. I wish we could just see that end. But I fully realize in the study of the Bible that we're not going to. We're going to see things increasingly grow worse and worse and worse until God draws the curtains on history, until he sends Jesus back. But this was a man who was named Relief because, as sometimes it's the case as well, people name their children that express their hope, their desire, what they wanted to see happen, what they were asking God to do. And what was the heart of Lamech, apparently? It was, God, please do something about all this evil that surrounds us and uh, give us relief, give us peace. Well, let me tell you a little bit more then as we work our way through the story then about Noah. Everybody knows the story about Noah. Everybody's heard it in Sunday school or vacation Bible school or uh, probably haven't heard it preached too much from the pulpit. I don't know um, sometimes because it's such a popular story. Maybe we avoid those uh, stories maybe a little bit more. I would just want to point out just at the beginning of his, um, of his introduction, uh, Genesis chapter 6. I want you to look at something with me at the very beginning that talks about how things were in the world at that time, what the conditions were like. Very peculiar story. And I'm going to tell you right at the outset that I don't know the final answer to it. Don't you just love it? You come to church and he's going to raise a question and he's not even going to answer it for us. Well, it happens. Okay. But listen to this. Look at this story. It came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also his flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. This is right at the beginning of the time Noah is going to start building this great ship. It's going to take 120 years to get it done. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were the old, of old men of renown. Um, some of you, no doubt, have read that story before, and you've wondered, what in the world was described here? What is this all about? And if you want to search the commentaries and so forth, you'll find out that there are all kinds of interpretations of what was happening here. You know, who were these, who were these uh, sons of God, and what is this that was going on with these women and these, uh, this super race of people, apparently, that were being developed and so forth, and well, let me just tell you what some of the views are very quickly as to what this was all about. Some believe that these were demons that somehow managed to cohabit with women. And the product of those cohabitations were children who were a super race. Not only a super race, but a super evil race. Because the description here, perhaps as you already saw, is that things are pretty bad here, whatever this was. There are others who say, well, the Bible doesn't show that angels could cohabit with men, so maybe it was demon-possessed men that are being talked about, that are being described here. And they were producing a civilization of evil and wickedness that just opposed everything that even came close to being right with God. And there are others who take views like political views who would say, no, what's happening here is you've got some evil, powerful rulers who have uh, taken control of everything, including people's thought processes and their religion and everything, and, and they were creating a whole civilization of God-haters. There are other views you can read about, but we won't go into any more. Let's not lose sight of why that little four-verse paragraph is here. It's not here to inform us of what kind of things maybe specifically were happening. It's here to tell us how bad things were on the earth. They had reached unbelievable proportions, whatever it was. Whatever your view is on this, whatever your favorite preacher's or commentator's view is on this, the overall point is things were in free fall away from Almighty God. And things were so bad that then verse 5, it sets us up for verse 5 when it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then it says, The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, 
and he was grieved in his heart. Can you imagine how bad things must have been when the Scripture describes God that way, of having regretted that he ever created mankind and placed him on the earth? This is how far people had fallen from him. So the Lord said in verse 7, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But then we'll be introduced to the one God has an answer to all of that that he's going to use. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. Noah was different. Noah didn't follow along with the crowd. Noah didn't immerse himself in that wicked culture. Noah didn't follow along with everything else that everybody was doing. He acted differently. He lived differently. He didn't fall in line with things for people's approval. Noah was a, Noah was a man who was a whole lot like Joshua later in Joshua 24, 15, when he made the statement, as for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Joshua was speaking to Israel at a time when he could already see that the seeds had been planted for people to stray from God. And Joshua says, don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. And then he makes that statement, as for me and my house, it's not going to happen. We will not stray from God. We will serve the Lord. Something we ought to learn, by the way, even at this early phase of the message, is that, uh, you know, it really is possible to... Uh, to walk with God in a world like our world. It is. It's possible. I could say it the other way. It's also possible for us to stray from God, right? Christians can stray from God. I, ha I have wondered how out of that godly line in chapter 5, for example, how it all boiled down to now there's only one guy left in his family. One man in his family. Because it's a godly line that was being described there, the line of, the line of Seth. So it's possible to completely stray even though you're a Christian. And the book of Hebrews has borne that out over and over. It's one of the things the writer of Hebrews has been stressing all along is some of you have fallen far away from Christ and you need to come back. Reacquaint yourself with Him. Recommit yourself to Him. Follow Him. Do as He has said He would have you to do. Be what He would have you to be. But it is also possible in a culture like ours, because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm just overwhelmed. I'm just surrounded by evil. And everywhere, everywhere I go and everything I read and everything I see, and I wonder, where is it going to end? How is it ever going to end? We're seeing our freedoms as believers in Christ in this country withering away. I don't know if you're aware of it, but they're withering away. Threats are being leveled against churches, against believers. We're gladly accepted when we're at the voting booth, if we'll vote a certain way. But we're told to keep our values to ourself and our opinions to ourself. There was a time in which, when my wife was teaching school, that she had a principal pull her aside one day, and she said, I, principal told her and said, I know your husband's a pastor, and I just want you to know one thing. Check your Christianity at the door. Can you imagine that? Being told that you're not allowed to talk about that? I'm glad I'm married to a woman who didn't obey that. But to imagine that somebody would tell you that you can't share your faith. That's part of your life that has to be left out in your relationship with the kids you're trying to teach. Well, Noah becomes the first man in the Bible to receive a direct command of God to do something. First guy, here he is. And that's to build an ark. And uh, it's here that we begin to see that outrageous faith begin to emerge. Uh, because after all, think about what God's told him to do. He's never seen rain before. He's never seen a flood before. <laughs> he probably said, an ark, you say? What is an ark? Um, can you imagine all the things that uh, God was asking him to do? But he made him understand enough and... Uh, with whatever little understanding he had, he obeys. He obeys. If we were to keep going in chapter 6, uh, you'd see the story about the building of that ark. Uh, it's enormous size, uh, 300 cubits long, you will read, and uh, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits tall. And um, there's a, 
debate goes on in Bible scholarship about how long is a cubit. For many, many years, it was kind of accepted as being the distance from this finger down to the elbow, which is about 18 inches. But um, uh, there are others who feel like that's not exactly totally accurate. It might be a little longer than that. We'll just stay with the 18-inch dimension here, though, for this morning, right? And um, if you're wanting to know how much that is, uh, how that figures out to be in uh, feet, that means this boat he was to build, this ark, was going to be 450 feet long. <laughs> 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. What do you think about a boat that size? Um, if you want some kind of, kind of comparison for the size that would be, um, the building that we have here, well, it's about, um, it's about 100 feet, 110 feet long, from down by the kitchen down to here. Uh, that's about 73 cubits, okay? 73 cubits as opposed to the 300. Um, and our building is about uh, 75 feet wide, um, so that's, uh, what is that, another uh, 50 cubits, and I don't know how tall this is exactly right here, but the ark was uh, supposed to be uh, uh, about 45 feet tall. I would guess it's probably twice the peak of this, uh, this room here. I don't think they had a cathedral ceiling in the ark, but um, that's probably about, that's, that's the size, that's the dimensions on this thing. Or let's put it another way. Football season has just gotten underway, and some of you watch football like I do. Uh, put it in the dimensions of a football field, okay? Um, the ark would be about one and a half football fields long, and it would be about another half the width of a football field wide. So you can see it's a pretty enormous structure, right? Also had three levels in it, okay? No elevator, I don't think, but three levels. And uh, it's going to hold all of these uh, people and, their, um, and the animals that are going to be in there. And um, no wonder it took him over 100 years to build it, okay? Didn't have Johnny Ballou to help him, okay? <laughs> so <we're gonna laughs> no, no fancy tools or anything, but whatever tools he had and uh, whatever wood he had, no wonder it took so long to build it. And it's often been pointed out, and we should note too, that uh, this is a boat that was built without a rudder. <laughs> or sails, or anything like that, because it wasn't going anywhere except up, right? <laughs> it was just going to ride the waves. And God was going to control the motions of that boat and the safety of all those who would be inside of it. Then comes that interesting part in chapter 7, the collection of the animals, the pairs, male and female. And chapter 7 and verse 2 uh, mentions by sevens. Uh, that some of the animals were brought in because once the ark and the flood is over with, there are going to be animals in addition. They're going to be needed for sacrifices because there are going to be sacrifices that uh, Noah's going to offer to Almighty God. So there's lots of animals there, lots of animals there. And the, the scientific community says, this is so ridiculous. Isn't this ridiculous? Can you imagine the wild animals all just coming together and walking up the plank and going to the rooms that are prepared for them? Isn't that ridiculous? Well... That's one of the big differences between us and the scientific community. There's a big philosophical difference. In the scientific community, miracles don't happen. <laughs> but we know they do, don't we? We know they do. And God is the God of creation, and God is the God who controls everything, including the movements of the animals. And if he wants them on the boat, they're going to get on the boat, <laughs> which is exactly what they did, exactly what they did. And then in chapter 7 and verse 16, when the animals are there, the scripture says, when everybody's aboard, the Lord closed the door. One door in the side of this thing, and God closed the door and closed them in. And then the flood came. It started to rain. And the fountains of the deep, the scripture says, broke loose, which sounds like water underneath the surface of the earth like we don't have in the kind of abundance that existed then. Water came from there. Water came falling from the sky. If you check from some of those resources that I talked to you about earlier that you might want to go check out, there's good reason to look at what the scripture says, and it seems like the earth one times was encapsulated with a huge water cloud that uh, accounts for a lot of the things that could be found in these early chapters of Genesis. But suddenly all the water is release, released and there's more than enough 
water there to cover even the tops of the mountains. And the Lord had closed them in. And the story goes on, and you know how it goes on and on. And for over a year, Moses, uh, Moses, Noah and his family and the animals are inside that ark until the judgment was satisfied. And we read then when um, Noah and uh, his family were able once again to come outside the ark in chapter 8 and verse 22, we read about a covenant that God made with not just Noah, but with all of us as well, stating that he would never destroy the earth again by water. Verse 22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, that shall not cease. There'll never be a flood like that again. Only the symbol in the sky with the, with the um, rainbow that we see that uh, shows us what had happened at that one time. Now, we hasten also to mention something else, and I uh, hope I'm not too early in my message with this, but um, gosh, I got this great book from um, uh, the summit conference that my wife and I went to a little over a week ago, and Irvin Lutzer spoke, and it's kind of a... Um, there's kind of an inside joke going on the whole time because while he was speaking, this is his latest book called The Eclipse of God. Oh, I, you got to get it. I'm reading it. And uh, he kept advertising his book, The Eclipse of God, The Eclipse of God, The Eclipse of God. And um, all throughout his message, he kept talking about this book that God wants you all to read and get a copy of read. And so there was this rush on the book table. And I got out there first and got my copy and, and uh, I began to read my copy. But one of the things that Erwin Lutzer says, and he wrote, if, you've ever, if you know him, if you know how he writes, he is a man of grace. He is a man who is clear on the gospel. He's a godly man that God has used many, many times in many, many ways. But one of the things he calls us to in that book, and he writes a whole chapter about it at the very end, and the chapter at the very end is to call us back to a full picture of God, a full picture of God. As he would put it, you know, we're really fond of talking about God being a God of grace and a God of love, and he is that, he is that, make no mistake about it. But he's also a God who hates sin. He's a God of wrath, and he's God one day who, who one day will judge sin. And uh, he calls us back. I mean, I, sometimes when I read his books, he says he's writing to the church at large, but I always feel like he's writing to me when I read his books, and he's, and he's calling pastors to come back and make sure that people understand what's at stake if they do not come to Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. There's a judgment coming. There's a judgment coming. That's what Noah was doing. He was telling people, there's a judgment coming. There's a judgment coming, and yet, can you imagine the mockery? Can you imagine what the crowds were doing as he's building this boat? <laughs> there's that crazy guy. Better call the authorities in here and have this guy carted off somewhere. He's lost his mind. But he kept being a preacher of righteousness, saying there's a judgment coming. There's a judgment coming. Here's your chance. This boat is your chance. Get on board. Get on board. And people just laughed and laughed until that day that he was shut up inside the boat and it began to rain. Lessons from Noah. Lessons from Noah and his outrageous faith. Back to Hebrews 11.7. Three things. Three things about Noah's outrageous faith that we need to learn. Number one is that outrageous faith follows and obeys God even when we don't understand <laughs> what God is asking us to do. Now, when I say don't understand, it doesn't mean I don't understand that I should be out sharing the gospel. I don't understand. I should be worshiping. I, you know, not that. But when he calls us to do specific things and we don't really understand why we would do those things, why we would be called upon to do those things, why I would be asked to do this, why I'm being told by God, I want you to go through this right now. Outrageous faith says, I'll just trust him. I'll just trust him. Because in time, it will come clear. In time, it will come clear. Verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 11, by faith Noah being warned by God about things not seen. 
things not seen. We might paraphrase that. Things not understood that he would not understand. He wouldn't understand rain. He wouldn't understand a flood. He wouldn't understand the need to build a boat. He wouldn't understand animals coming just for no unexplained reason, just suddenly coming and going and getting on that boat. He wouldn't understand any of that. Things unseen. He wouldn't understand any of that. But God told him to do this. And he did. And he did. He must have wondered as well, and just um, talk about things unseen. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a part of us sometimes that realizes that when we see bad things going on that, uh, wow, or I say realizes, maybe at least thinks that it's never going to change. It's just never gonna, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse, and, and, and we keep praying that Jesus will come and, and it will all end and, and we'll all go to heaven, and, 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 and then year after year, it just keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. And sometimes don't you find yourself as a Christian a little bit frustrated saying, God, how much more can you take before you step in and bring this all to a close? How much more? How much more? But outrageous faith says, even when I don't understand, I will follow and trust him. I will follow and obey him. Um, outrageous faith also, secondly, Follows and obeys God in a way that the world doesn't understand. That the world under doesn't understand. What does the world see when it looks at us as Christians? And I'm talking about if we're a Christian who's really striving to follow after Jesus Christ. What does the world see around us when they see us here on Sunday morning of all times? When there's so much that can be done. You know, Sundays come to be called the day of rest. Why aren't you resting? What are you doing going down there to that church and listening to that insane preacher and <laughs> singing some songs and, and whatever? And giving your money to it. And What does the world see? What does the world think about us? Well, a lot of people and would probably say, well, okay, that's, that's their religion and, and, uh, and that's okay. That's, that's a good thing. That, that's okay um, for them. Um, used to share an office in my days as an engineer with an older guy that um, we got along just fine, but, uh, but he just wasn't into Christianity. And we had some conversations, and, and I remember one day he finally just said to me, he says, look, that's fine for you. He says, and I, and I, I respect churches. I think churches are great places because they are places where people can learn about ethics and morality and, and how to live right, work hard, be fair. But that's as far as it went with him. As far as a salvation that is needed when this life is over, he didn't buy into that. Didn't buy into that. What does the world see when it looks at us? When it looks at us. The second part of the verse addresses that when it says, In reverence, Noah prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world. By which he condemned the world. That phrase is interesting, by which he condemned the world, as to um, what it refers to. Um, some think it was um, his preaching that Noah didn't, didn't you know, he didn't uh, compromise on his preaching. He told people a way of salvation. He also told them that there was a judgment coming. He balanced the two. And so some feel like that was part of it, and maybe all of it. The crowd out there day after day coming for a good laugh and hearing a good sermon if they take time to listen to it. There are others who uh, feel like that what that's just referring to is just the fact that, that Noah would not immerse himself, would not join hands with the culture of the day. Everybody else was doing whatever they did, but you would not find the family of Noah there if it was sinful, if it was wrong. I don't know uh, which or if we even need to make a choice on that. I know something that Romans 1.32 tells us, though, that we do need to take note of is that um, sin has a funny way of operating on people. Sin has a funny way of operating on in the lives of people. Romans 1.32 says that, and it lists a bunch of sins that overtake a culture, and then it makes the comment, and I'm paraphrasing here, 
that they don't want to do it alone. Sin wants to draw other people in with it. People who are sinners want others to be part of what they're doing. It's the way sin operates. It's not comfortable being alone. It wants others to adopt as well the things that are going on. And isn't that what we have seen? A few years ago, it used to be preached that um, um, Christians ought to be tolerant. Tolerant, that was the big word. Tolerance was the big word, the buzzword in our society. And tolerance originally used to mean, meant, okay, you live like you live. I'll live like I live, and okay, that'll be fine. But tolerance has taken on a new definition in our lifetimes. Tolerance doesn't now say, okay, you can do what you want. Now it says, uh, and I'll do what I want. Tolerance now says, you have to approve what I do. And I want you to be part of what I do. And if you don't do that, well, you're not tolerant. You're a bigot. You're no longer a tolerant person. The world doesn't understand believers when we walk with Jesus Christ. It doesn't understand that we live by a different set of standards with different goals in mind, different understandings of what we're here to do. Here's a third one very quickly. Outrageous faith follows and obeys God because of something that we do understand, what we understand. The rest of verse 7, that uh, we understand that we are heirs of righteousness, which is according to faith. We understand that we are heirs. You know what an heir is? An heir is a person who inherits something at the end, right? We inherit something at the end. And Paul in Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 stated this just like the author here does in Hebrews. He says we are heirs, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We're not living for this. We're living for that which is to come when Jesus Christ again assumes his role of exercising total control over everything because the creation is his. It belongs to him. And when it belongs to him and we belong to him, well, that belongs to us too. We are heirs. Someday we will be joint heirs with him. Noah's quite a guy. There's more to his story about his failings, you know, in Genesis. I won't go there. The writer here doesn't. The writer here just wants us to see that time when he expressed outrageous faith and to say one thing, be like him. Be like him. Follow his example. Father, I thank you today that you have given us another example of what it means to follow you, to trust you. And I pray today that this example of Noah will now become another of our examples what you've given us to do and what you've given us to be, help us to pursue. With all our heart, with all our mind, in every circumstance and situation, and we'll praise you and thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, give us that ability to express outrageous faith this week. Whatever circumstance we find ourselves, whatever is going on in our lives, helps to be people who focus on you, draw on your strength, live by your principles, and see you work in the way only you can. But make us into people of outrageous faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.